continuing our How's Life Going, our series on the Beatitudes as we continue through Beatitude by Beatitude. So I'm going to bring up that question. When you think of the word inheritance, inheritance, what came to mind over the last half an hour? When you think of the word inheritance, shout it out. What? A gift, okay? Faith, okay? Let's go specific on the gifts, all right? My, yes, my, yes, money. Yeah, ab, that's the first one on my sheet. Well, I wonder what they'll say. I wrote money, okay? Money, it can be an inheritance, absolutely. What else? Junk, okay, thanks. <laughs> Junk. I wonder what the sermon would be like if I just went with that. Yeah, all right. Blessed are the meek for the junk they will inherit. Okay, uh, no, uh, money, clothes, junk. Okay, what else? Property, yeah. You got a piano. Okay, did it work? Oh, very good. Okay, what did you say? Your traits. Oh, it, ah, yes, thank you. Uh, everyone on my dad's side, my dad was 6'1", my aunt was six foot. my uncles were all 6'2", 6'3". My grandma on the other side was 4'8". Thank you, grandma. And uh, yeah, so all of these things, right, we think of, I wrote in here rock collection, and I don't know why, but it's in there. Uh, maybe you got a rock collection. Maybe someone in my travels has said they got a rock collection. But I do remember a family conflict, actually a resolution three years ago. Uh, I'm not going to name any names because more than likely some of you are related to them uh, in somewhere on the bingo card. And uh, their, their parents deceased and they never made up a will or they made up a will for most of the things. There was three family members, two, two sons and a daughter, and there were these three incredibly creepy dolls that were not written up as far as possessions in a will. And the family went nuts over these. They must have been worth a lot of money or something. For four hours, I helped lead like a conflict resolution for these families because of the inheritance of these three incredibly creepy dolls. And yes, I'm going to use that term incredibly every time I talk about them because I saw a picture of them and gave me nightmares. And yet for four hours, we had this conflict over an inheritance. It was unbelievable. So finally, what we came up to, you know, they, you know I said toward the end, as just exhausted, right? Uh, I just kind of said at the end, listen, you can't miss what you never had. And so they all agreed to that. Why we couldn't do that within five minutes, I don't know. Uh, but we ended up so selling them, and they donated the money. And so that be, it's funny that inheritance... Just the idea of them are, can cause people just to go run absolutely mad over them, absolutely crazy over things that really were never given to us yet, right? It's something you never had. Unfortunately, I've had people in conversation say, oh yeah, well when uncle so-and-so or when grandpa so-and-so die, this money's coming our way. That we, we've kind of gotten in this understanding that inheritance means that we're going to get something. But the adage is true, you can't, you can't miss what you never had, right? But it's this understanding that we already have it, right? That if there's, you know, uh, you know, especially, you know, spouses, when you start taking out life insurance policies, like you might start looking at each other differently because you're worth probably more than what they thought and all this kind of stuff. But it's so funny that we kind of take stock in inheritance. It's a big word. And I wish I could say that the idea of inheritance was always positive. But what I have found uh, in the 13, almost 14 years now in the pastorate, that inheritance usually surrounds a couple of different kind of emotions or ideals. Greed, entitlement, unspoken expectations, and covetedness. So not all very positive, right? It's not a very positive Thing. So I want you to keep this conversation about inheritance. Don't put it in the back of your brain where you'll forget about it. Put it in the middle because we're going we're gonna to talk about it toward the end of the message. So we're jumping into uh, Matthew, right? We're going to be in Matthew 5, verse 5, and it is the next beatitude, and that is blessed, Matthew 5, 5, will be it also in Psalms, but Matthew 5, 5 is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
We're going to get to the congratulations. Leave this, this verse up here for a second. Uh, so we've already had, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Congratulations to the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Remember, if, you, if you're new or you haven't heard the last two weeks, one of the definitions in the Greek for blessed is congratulations. And that, for a lot of people, that's probably the number one thing I've heard as far as response to where we've gone the last couple weeks with the Beatitudes is this idea of congratulations. Congratulations to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Congratulations to those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Congratulations to the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, we have to remember, these are kingdom ethics, right? For the first two weeks, we went through the kingdom of God. That those who claim the king, Jesus, and live under the king's reign, these are the characteristics by which we ought to live. These are the ethics of the kingdom. To be poor in spirit, to be those who mourn, not mourn, and we talked about mourn over death and suffering, but really the mourning over our sin. Do we mourn over our sin, or just do we expect God to be this grace ATM and forgiveness genie that we just say the right things, he forgives us, we keep going, we do it again, and we just get in this ugly pattern, but do we mourn over our sin? And just for simple review, the basics of the kingdom, Jesus is the king, the kingdom is the church in the world, and the kingdom to come when Jesus comes back to make all things new. Now, we focused a lot over the last couple of weeks on the first part of the beatitude. And that's the actual kind of behavioral modification, right? For many of us, we look at this as, okay, so I got to change my behavior, right? Well, maybe I'm not poor in spirit, I have to be poor in spirit. Maybe I don't mourn over my sin, I should mourn over my sin. Maybe I'm not a meek person, I should be a meek person. And so we have this as kind of like behavior modification meaning. And they go so much deeper than that. And I can find value in my stuff, but I need to be poor in spirit. And I, 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 I can be sad about my sin, and I probably shouldn't do it anymore, but I need to mourn now over my sin. Where do we go with today? With the idea of being meek. Congratulations, or blessed are the meek. What comes to your mind when you think of the word meek? What comes to your mind when you think of the word meek? Humility, okay. That's what you're going to say? Timid, interesting, okay. What? Bad? Actually, some people look at it that way. Two points, Joey, good job. Others? A doormat. This is great. You're going both sides of the definition, and it's a beautiful thing. Or else my sermon's not going to make any sense. So that's good. Okay, so we have a lot of these. And for a lot, some of us, we go to more of the negative side of meek. Meek, you know, being timid, being bad, being a doormat. Doormat's an interesting one. But meek, the Greek adjectives for meek. So if we're going to go into the Greek side, because the New Testament, written in Greek, right? Gentleness, humility, considerate, uh, to be, being considerate, being courteous. So blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the humble, blessed are the considerate, blessed are the courteous. Ouch. When we actually look at the, the, the living definitions of what meek is, humility, being considerate, being gentle, being courteous, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more real. Because I know... God knows, I know, my wife knows, my kids know. I sometimes can be rough, can be gruff. I can be egotistical, I can be narcissistic, I can be self-centered, I can be rude. And my guess is I'm not alone. I'm not here calling you all out for all of that, but that is kind of the battle that we deal with every day, right? That we could be rough, we could be gruff, we could be narcissistic, we can be rude, we could be egocentric or egotistical. And if that, if we find ourselves in that place... More times than not, then God has something for us this morning. And congratulations to the meek, for they shall inherit the, the earth. It's important to note, and John Stott helps us understand this this morning. It's important to note that the Beatitudes, the meek, comes between those who mourn over sin, and then next week, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This particular form of meekness, which Christ requires as king to his disciples, those living under the king, will surely have something to do with this sequence. 
mourning over sin, being meek, hunger and thirsting to be a righteous person, being a person of truth. And sometimes when we think of this idea of meek, I want to go back to the doormat definition whoever gave that. Sometimes we think about that when it comes to Jesus. Sometimes when we think of the idea of Jesus, that he's this meek, mild character, right? We think of the picture of him as weak or maybe even Eeyore-like, you know, going back to Winnie the Pooh, right? Eeyore, you know, that he's kind of just, you know, walking around and, you know, just kind of in a lamentful state for people, but he's healing, he's doing all of those things, because in a lot of ways, we look at like Matthew 11, where he talks about being humble in heart, we think that the idea of someone who's gentle and humble and meek and considerate and compassionate is kind of this introverted, kind of Eeyore-like person. I don't know if that could be farther from the truth, but a lot of us, especially in society over the last I don't know, 40 or 50 years, we've placed this understanding of Jesus so, my word, wrongly in, in, in who he was. We like to have him as this white-skinned, robe-wearing, long, beautiful, straight, blonde hair, kind of gave off a hippie vibe with a beauty peasant sash. We kind of have this mentality of the person of Jesus, and I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the definition of who this Jesus actually was. And when we consider him that way, then we're not really engaging the reality of the culture of the Bible. Hint, he probably wasn't white, right? Because it was in the Middle East. It was in Israel, in that area. But again, we don't need to get, get, get lost in that. But when we place Jesus into this kind of passive you know, and I hate to say it, but like hippie-like person, that is not who Jesus was. That is not the way Jesus lived, and it really isn't the way Jesus taught. He, he taught, again, we look at this idea of meek as weak. A lot of people, you know, translate meek as weak, and it's not. It's knowing when to be strong and knowing when to be not strong, or knowing when to, when to be meek. Knowing when to be loud and knowing when to be quiet. Knowing, then, uh, knowing when to kind of be direct and knowing when maybe you just need to sit back a minute. That's what meek encompasses. And the meekness that Jesus was talking about, and I even have it, so I don't who said doormat? Who said doormat? Over there. So I'm going to give Karen a high five, right? Uh, the meekness of Jesus, and I even have doormat in my message. So uh, the meekness that Jesus was talking about wasn't a doormat personality trait that a lot of people think of. And when something like inheriting the earth is kind of the end game, wouldn't that go to the folks who think that it would be about power and conquering and those who had to fight for it, right? If, if, if earth, because that's what it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is property. This is authority. This is power. Like, isn't it weird that meekness gets us this? Wouldn't it be, blessed are the determined, for they shall inherit the earth. Right? Blessed are the, the powerful. Blessed are the, the strategic. Blessed are the authority. Shouldn't we put all of those words there? Because then inheriting the earth should qualify? But let's go back to the beginning when we talked about the idea of inheritance. And inheritance isn't some, is not, you know, you didn't, you know, hopefully in your family, it's like, oh, I earned grandpa's inheritance. You know, I, I, I made sure that every week I was at grandpa's house cutting his lawn so that I know I would get this when he died. If you're premeditating a lot of that in your life, please come talk to me because that's not healthy and that's not actually loving grandpa. And so we have to have this understanding that an inheritance is something that is given to us. It's given to us after something happens. In our culture, it's usually someone's death. Some of you may already know where we're going to go, but we'll get there in a second. That inheriting the earth should be something far better, far greater. Blessed are the meek. Sometimes we engage and go, well, this one, man, he really struck out. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That doesn't seem to connect in our 2019 kind of culture mind. But if we take a look back at the kingdom ethics so far, they're so far different than the power structures we've built in our society. And it was the same back then. It was all about power and leadership and manipulation and all of that. It's, you know, biblical times in 2019 the only difference really is they didn't have the internet. 
you know, a lot of the things are still the same. But the kingdom attributes so far throw a lot of this on itself. Where Jesus is looking at the 2019, the powerful, the rich, usually the corrupt seem to win, right? We look at today's culture, and what Jesus is saying is that it flips on itself. That's not what it's about. The Old Testament was filled with the idea of the wicked seeming to increase their land and their property and all of these things. We look at the politics of the day and the politics of the Old Testament, and they don't look very different. And so we understand that, that in Old Testament days, the wicked seemed to triumph. And the holy and humble people of God still had to have the confidence that they and all things ultimately belong to God. Even in the face of the wicked winning, right? And you look at the people of Israel. Now, the Israelites, they didn't do themselves any favors, right? They fell in it more times than not. But the people of God had to see. We look at the David, right? We went through the Psalms with David over the summer. How many times was he looking around and seeing the evil win? Yet he still had that confidence that everything belonged to God. The confidence was never expressed more than that than in Psalm 37. Which is interesting because Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 37 in this beatitude. So let's show it. Let's read it together. Psalm 37, the first 11 verses. Listen to these words and think of 2019. I think it parallels very well. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man, over the man who carries out evil devices. Retain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Friends, the idea of meekness is so well described in Psalm 37, it's unbelievable. But one observation we have to start to, to land the plane as we go this morning as I close. Notice that three times, verse 1, 7, and 8, advises us not to fret, right? A definition of fret is to worry, to fuss, to agonize. How does fretting contradict an attitude of meekness? A meek person trusts. A meek Christian trusts in God in all aspects of life, good, bad, and ugly. Notice that Jesus is giving, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are uh, those who mourn. You can do all of these things and not be a believer, right? You can. I can, if I'm, a, if I, if I'm a, a Buddhist or a Hindu, right, or uh, if I uh, maybe am even an atheist, I can still mourn, but I'm mourning over the wrong things. I can still be poor in spirit, and it means I just don't have a lot of money or a lot of earthly possessions, yet I can still not, I can still just not trust in kind of a higher power or trust in myself to do good, right? I can be meek. An atheist can be a meek person. Right? They can be. But the difference is the centrality, the start, the foundation of these beatitudes. It is the King Jesus, which makes these things so much powerful. Because an atheist who's meek isn't going to inherit a thing. And if we're really honest this morning, though it may be uncomfortable, they're going to inherit hell. If an atheist who does not claim Jesus as Lord dies, right, they can be meek all the way to hell. And that's uncomfortable, and we don't like that. But it is the case. Fret not. Why? Why does the psalmist call us not to fret? Because the opposite of that is trusting. A meek person trusts. A meek Christian trusts God in all aspects of life. Good, bad, and ugly. So Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Congratulations to the meek. They'll inherit the earth. In the psalm that says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundant 
peace. How many of you have peace in your life right now? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. But this idea of peace, unwavering, unending, unconditional peace. I have a different place to go in my, in my sermon, but I'm not going to go there this morning. Because there's something about peace that I want to center on as we close this morning. That peace in the midst of trial... Peace in the midst of agony. Peace in the midst of whatever issue you want to put here. At the end of the day, talking with all of you that come and maybe talk with me about your struggles in life, things that you pray, you know, pray for, things you text me or email me. One of my biggest prayers, any prayer for a shepherd over their sheep should be peace. Because it's a peace that I don't fully understand, your elders don't fully understand, we don't fully understand as people. That Jesus grants a peace. He is the prince of peace, right? His reign is peace. And we don't get that. Because so many of us in our lives, chaos is the flavor of the day. Anxiety is the flavor of the day. Doubt is the flavor of the day. Stress is the flavor of the day. That Christ is there as king. And he grants us peace. For some of us, we don't like that. We'd rather power, we'd ha- rather authority, we'd rather to, you know, have be the dominant. But friends, if one thing that we're seeing in this Beatitude study, there's nothing here about the dominant. It's all about those who submit their lives to the king, right? Now, that may not answer the questions or the issues for you like that, right? It's, it, it isn't necessarily an instant fix. It's a journey to work through. It's asking yourself the right questions in trial. What is God trying to teach me? Where do my eyes and my heart have to be open to X, Y, or Z? And this peace of God that transcends all understanding, as Philippians says, right? Paul writes this, that will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, that the king is there to guard you in times of anxiety by giving you peace. The anxiety when the bank account gets really, really low, Peace, perspective. The, account, the time when the account gets really, really, really high still wants you to have peace and perspective. When that relationship just doesn't seem to be righted, peace and perspective. When that untimely death comes in, in the family, peace and perspective. That God is calling all of us to be meek, not weak, not a doormat. A meek person knows who they are in Christ, stands confidently on the word of God, the gospel, which is given to us in the scriptures, and a meek person leads their life with that. Not with agenda, not with power, not with authority, but with an understanding of compassion and love. Because the opposite, in the Bible, the opposite of meekness ultimately is our depravity. The opposite of this, the, 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 the anti-meek person, according to the Beatitudes, this is going to hurt, I, I, but we all are here, the opposite of the meek person isn't loud and power driven, the opposite person of meek rebels ultimately against God. And that's what Jesus is trying to splice the two, right? He's saying, blessed are the meek, for they all inherit the earth. If we claim Jesus as Lord and live under his reign, our meekness then is an avenue to bring people to the king. Otherwise, we are living for ourselves, and if any of us are doing that, we are rebelling against God. Even if you say, oh, I have given 99.9% of my life to Jesus. He's the king over 99.9% of my life. That 0.1% is still rebelling against God. It's in our nature. It's in our DNA. It's part of our depravity. Hi, welcome to Munster Church. Hopefully that felt good. But it's the, case, it's the truth of the matter, right? It's where we are. It is the daily battle against our flesh. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Remember, the meek inherit. And what do they inherit again? The earth. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, it was the land promise of Israel. Great. And we see that play out. The New Testament, it's the church. But the meek will also inherit the new heaven, the new earth. The meek will inherit eternal relationship with God. 
friends, this is not about land or property. This is about your soul and salvation. That when we are meek, right, that, that, that when, when we are meek, that when, uh, the inheritance ultimately is the eternal relationship with God. Remember, when great-grandpa dies, he doesn't give you a watch. You know, he doesn't give the watch to a perfect stranger, right? When, when great-grandpa dies or when someone dies and they give, they usually give to people in the family, right? And for some people, they just donate their money to a cause, and that's fine too, right? If you, you know, uh, if you want to work with Providence, right? If you want to work uh, over there with the Barnabas Foundation, they can help uh, you give some of your money back to the church. That's great. That's not the point of the sermon, but when a family member dies, they usually give the inheritance to someone in the family, right? I told you we get there. Some of you are already there. When Jesus died and he rose again and salvation was now made, that relationship now connected to the Father, that becomes our inheritance, those that are in the family. Some of us, we don't like that. That sounds really us and them. But let's see what the basis of the Beatitudes are, right? The basis of the Sermon on the Mount. Those under the kingship of Christ inherit what the king has. Friends, our king Jesus owns everything. Nothing doesn't belong to Jesus, right? He owns everything. Everything is under his rule. He was there in creation, and he will be there again in the restoration and the glorification. Everything, every square inch belongs to the king. And guess who gets the inheritance? His people. And for a lot of us, we bank on that. Woohoo! We got it. Salvation. Woo! Yes. We could be excited about it. But our Heavenly Father sent His Son to die for each of us so that we would have a way of living our life on earth and the ups and the downs of this life. Not to keep it to ourselves, right? Hide it under a bushel, no, right? All around the neighborhood, the light of the King will shine. And who is it going to shine through? You and me, the church. If the church is not shining the light of the king, what is the church doing? Churches that choose not to shine the light in the neighborhood should be shut down. Because they're not, they're a country club, they're not a church. That churches need to shine the light of the king. Why? Because that is what we are called to do. We are not called to do it in a dominant, crusades-like way. We are called to do it through the whisper of encouragement. Through love in dark times, walking alongside the person in struggle and strife, sometimes saying nothing, sometimes offering a cup of coffee in a conversation, sometimes offering a hug in sacred silence. Congratulations to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Congratulations to the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Do you understand that your inheritance is heaven? Do you understand that your inheritance is forever, an everlasting life with Jesus? Friends, that's not something we're supposed to keep to ourselves. I guarantee you, each and every one of you know someone that does not have that inheritance yet. Pray and ask that God will give you the words to speak, the timing. He'll set all of that up. He's good like that. He's God like that. To be able to introduce them to the king. Say, hey, do you know Jesus? Now, they're going to probably think that you're just a crazy person, but that's okay. Live with it. Work through it. Why? Because their salvation is at hand. Are we living with that sense of urgency that other salvation is at hand? Because that's what this is about. The reign of God over everything, every square inch. Good reform theology, right? And if every square inch belongs to God, there are plenty of people that still don't know that. So let's put our boots on. Let's continue to get to work. Let's pray. Father, in those times that I know I don't want to be meek, 
please bring to mind this beatitude. Remind me that the inheritance of everlasting life doesn't come through a clanging gong or cymbal. It doesn't come through a bullhorn and judgment. But comes through compassion and gentleness, being considerate and courteous. Not accepting of sin, but bringing grace and understanding. Father, may we be a meek people that are ready to go wherever you call us to go, to the ends of the earth, whether that is Ridge and Holman or rather that is in another country. May we be a meek people, poor in spirit, mourning over our sin, being gentle and compassionate to the world around us. To each other here, being courteous and compassionate with each other, but then going out and doing the exact same thing. May it never be said of us that we are really good Christians on Sunday. And let that be the end of the sentence. Carry us out into our week. Give us the mission of the gospel to shine the light wherever it is you have called us to shine it. And we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We all agree and said, amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing our closing song, Only King Forever. And go into this week and maybe do some research on meek. What does that mean for you? Maybe what needs to change? What do you need to do more? And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, which always passes our understanding. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.